Right, well, we're looking at Acts, as you know, um, at this time, with this as our driving headline, Acts 1, verse 8, which I'm sure you're familiar with by now. It's uh, what Jesus said to the disciples to go and wait because they were going to receive the Holy Spirit and then they were going to share about Christ, about him, about his work, about his salvation to the rest of the world, starting locally and spreading out. We're still spreading out. Today's portion from Acts chapter 3, they're still in Jerusalem, right at the beginning of it all, because that's where it all happened. It was obviously the place, the center to start and to share the things that uh, they had to bring to everyone. It isn't to some, it isn't to a few, it isn't to any particular nation or creed or whatever it is. The message of Jesus and his salvation is for all. God didn't exclude anybody. If he said Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the rest of the world, that includes the rest of the world. I understand there are still a few bits, tribes or so so much that haven't yet heard about Jesus, but it's in the process. They're working it out and sharing them with a story. We're starting here today on, uh, in Acts chapter 3 about uh, uh, what it is to be in response to this commission that the disciples were given. Because the disciples were given the commission, but it isn't just to the disciples. Well, it's to every disciple of every age, really, that uh, we still need to begin with the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to come into our life, to rule in our life. Do you understand that we have two experiences of the Holy Spirit, at least? The first one is at our salvation, the Holy Spirit it is that convicts us that we need Jesus and we need help in our lives. We need to re recognize that Jesus died to bring that to us and to give us the gift of eternal life. And uh, that's why we need the Holy Spirit. And then we need, as people dedicated to the ministry of, uh, that Christ gave, this that's outlined in Acts 1 and verse 8, that uh, we need to be equipped for it. And that is that even today we need that other experience of the Holy Spirit to empower as well as to encourage and to give us the directions for the rest of our life and how our life and work and ministry, whatever it might be, can be a reflection of Jesus to the world. And uh, in this part of chapter 3 that we're looking at, we... Uh, following on obviously from the healing of the cripple last week and uh, I, I asked myself a couple of questions really um, if he was being delivered as it were to this place in the temple out of court where he was begging and he'd been doing it presumably from being very young because he was born in that condition and this had been going on and going on and going on. Peter and John must have seen him in the past. They must have walked past him, maybe thrown a few coins in his bowl, I don't know. But uh, he was obviously very visible. And uh, I wonder also, maybe Jesus might have seen him. Jesus went to the temple. Why didn't Jesus heal him? Well, I think Jesus was wiser than that. He knew that there needed to be demonstrations by the early disciples. And I think he might have thought, I'll leave that one for Peter and John. <laughs> because they needed the encouragement of having received the Holy Spirit. They had power to minister in Jesus' name and in Jesus' fashion, which is what they did. And Peter, if I can start with Peter, just an ordinary disciple really, if there's any such thing as an ordinary disciple. You know, there was no special thing. We read in uh, the book of Matthew, if I can just turn that up for a few verses. Here. 
Here we are. Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, etc., etc. I wanted to highlight Peter because... Uh, very often and certainly in some parts of the Christian church we give Peter great eminence and believe that what Jesus was saying was that he was going to build his church on Peter you probably know the name Peter means rock and uh, so Peter is a rock or his name indicates that that he's a rock and we think well if he's the rock then Jesus might be building his church on Peter and that's why Peter was the start of it on the day of Pentecost and this is Peter doing this miracle at the temple but in actual fact that isn't what Jesus is saying at all in Matthew 16 because what Jesus said um, you are Simon or Peter so this was not revealed to you by man but by my father in heaven and I tell you you are Peter now in Greek the name Peter is Petros you'll have to take my word for it okay the name Peter is Petros and it means little rock a stone that could be picked up you would use a Petros if you're stoning somebody to death you would use a Petros if you make in a gravel path. But Petros is little rock. And that's what Peter is. So Jesus is actually saying, you are a little rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. And when he says on this rock, the word is Petra, not Petros. So he was... Uh, saying, Peter, you're a little rock, but on this big rock, that big rock being what Peter had said to him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, he says on that fact is how the church is going to be built. It's going to be built on Jesus, the son of the living God, the Petra. Now you probably know there's a place called Petra in Jordan. Ever heard of it? Anybody ever been there? Wow, well done Israel. It's a, 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 a town or village that, I don't know, 300 BC, they were fed up of the wars they were getting, so they decided to build this place to live that would be safe. And they carved it out of the solid rock. And uh, uh, you, you may have seen it on TV or whatever, that this place, Petra. In fact... Um, there is a James Bond film. <laughs> I know he's the film buff, but there was a James Bond film at which James Bond rode on horseback through Petra. And that film was... Yeah, he doesn't know. <laughs> what? No. No, it was James Bond, of course. He was, the world is not enough. And James Bond says in that film, he says, our family motto is, the world is not enough. And that motivated him in the work that he was uh, engaged in. But you may not know this, it's a bit of general information. Um, the world is not enough where did they get that from? Hmm? Ian Fleming. It, 
I, I don't know whether Ian Fleming wrote that one or whether it's one that's been made up on the calendar. But yes, well, let's say Ian Fleming. Well, I'll tell you where it comes from. It's very local. It's a place called, if I can remember, um, just between Corf Castle, and if you go down that road, you go through the firing range and where the army are, do their practicing and everything else. And uh, there's a little village there that you can visit on some days. You can't visit it on every days because the army use it. Hmm? Tynum. Tynum, yes. It's the village of Tynum. And the, uh, the lord of the manor there, who, who used to rule it, known it, he lived in a big house called uh, Tynum House, which was said to be one of the best houses in Dorset. And uh, this family, whose name was Bond, the Bond family lived there, and they owned the property around there until the Second World War, when it was uh, taken from them, and they were promised that after the war they'd be able to go back. So all the villagers had to leave, the Bond family had to leave, and uh, eventually the war ended. But they were not allowed to go back because the army decided they want to keep it because it was good territory to do their tank practice and firing practice. And very often when you drive through that area, you hear them firing guns and things like that, or maybe see tanks crossing the road. But uh, it, it's a little village. It's interesting to see how they lived in those days. The houses, are most of them have lost their roofs now, and some are kind of derelict. But there's still two things that are, are still together. The classroom for the children and the church, which is an Anglican church, obviously. And uh, they are still there, and you can go in them, and you can see the lessons the kids were having at the time. And you can go in the church, and uh, there's a, a memorial to uh, the Bond family, and their motive is, orbis non sufficit. <laughs> in Latin, which in English is, the world is not enough. So it's interesting that he should choose that as the name for the Bond family. I don't think it's interesting. I think he researched, as you, you know, as we would think, and found that to be so. But that's so local. It's down the road. You can visit it today if you want to. Uh, it's not far away. But anyway, that's Peter. And uh, so he was really just an ordinary disciple, just like everybody else. We need to know that, that uh, we know Jesus was with him, he was special, but so is everyone else who comes to God, and we all come on the same level, and uh, God appreciates us. But I think that saying, the world is not enough, is something that we could adopt, really, because for us, the world isn't enough. For some people, uh, uh, really, they love the world, they desire to own more, to accumulate more, and to build themselves uh, a better place within the world. But for the Christian, the world is not enough. We shouldn't be satisfied with riches, with big houses, with whatever it is. We have nothing wrong with them, but that shouldn't be, uh, bring us all the satisfaction that we can have. Our satisfaction and our desire is to spend an eternity in the presence of God Almighty and our loving Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And so, for us, the world should never be enough. We should always be striving for the best. And the best is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And uh, this verse in Acts, I haven't got past Acts 1 verse 8 yet, I'm sorry. Um, but in, in, in this verse of Acts uh, Chapter 1, uh, uh, for chapter 1, verse 8, which tells us that they're going to receive uh, power from on high, the Holy Spirit, and that they've got to be witnesses. And uh, it was important that they waited till they received the power. They could witness without it, but with it, they could do more than witness, and they could demonstrate the love and the power of God physically and in all sorts of ways that they couldn't do 
before. So let's read the next few verses in this chapter that we're looking at. As we know, um, the man got healed. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and uh, came running to them in a place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? And I want to carry on reading. Uh, The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. So, first of all, Peter starts in a funny place. In order to get the people on board, he first accuses them. And it's pretty hard on them, really, isn't he? Although it's true, they are the ones. They had experienced Jesus in their midst. And they had decided to reject him, to not believe what he was saying, and to not trust what he was doing. And so, in a sense, they were guilty. They were the ones who actually... um, decided that Jesus shouldn't live. And uh, so uh, Peter wanted them to realise that they were being astounded by the miracle, but now Peter was saying that uh, you rejected the person who has done this miracle. Not me, Peter. It was Jesus. You may have rejected him, you may have killed him, but he has risen again. And... uh, He is now directing operations, if you like, and it's through the power of his name that this man received back the ability. I won't say received back because he'd never had the ability, but he's received the ability to walk. In fact, he'd received two new things. One, he could walk, and two, he could enter the temple. Because he was a cripple, he wouldn't have been allowed in the temple in those days. Blind people and crippled people were excluded from temple worship. No wonder he went with Peter and John walking and leaping and praising God. Because he could be a normal human being worshipping in the temple a God who had always been afar off from him. But not only that, he'd actually experienced God. Didn't only know about God, he'd experienced God. And that brought him great pleasure as well as a fantastic life ahead. And so Peter is putting the the blame, putting the uh, credit in the right place. He didn't, he said, it's not me, it's Jesus. What a shame you killed him. And then he goes on to say, but uh, get the next one. But you killed him, the author of life, but he's been raised again from the dead. God raised him from the dead. We're witnesses of this. We've seen it ourselves with our own eyes. And by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. In other words, Peter's saying, it's not me, it's not us. It's the name of Jesus that carries the power and authority to do these things. And uh, by faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. And uh, so it's important that we we realize that this was part of the commission that uh, Jesus was giving to the disciples, that uh, they could do the things that he'd been doing and they'd experienced it on several occasions. They'd seen Jesus and how he worked. But also in their training as disciples, he'd given them opportunity to actually uh, do it themselves. And he sent them out. And I, There's a couple of things I want us to read. First of all, uh, Jesus called his 12 disciples. This is when they were doing their learning, when they were followers of Jesus. He brought them together and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. 
heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you've received, freely give. So this was their practice that they should uh, go out and practice what he was doing and what he had been doing. They were just men. At that time they were just learners. They were students of Jesus. But they had the opportunity under his authority, not what God had given them, but what God had put in Jesus, with his authority to do these things. And it gives us an idea, therefore, that the ministry that Jesus is giving to the church is to do these things, to heal diseases, to proclaim the message, to raise the dead, okay? If I die, please don't raise me. I don't want it. I'll take what's coming. <laughs> to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. If you think I've got a demon, please drive it out. <laughs> drive out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. But the beautiful thing is, it wasn't just the 12. I don't know if you know how it worked in those days. Um, why did Jesus pick these people like Peter he was just a fisherman in, in, in those days there were rabbis you know um, teachers from the church and uh, the rabbis used to go once well very often to the, the rabbi school where people are graduating there was students who go there to learn the Old Testament practices and the Old Testament laws and uh, the, the rabbis used to go at the end of term, at the end of their session, and uh, find out who was the best, who had got the highest score, who had learned the lessons, and they would invite them to become followers, followers of that rabbi, uh, which meant they went everywhere with him, and uh, they followed him, and uh, superstition that they had was if they could walk in the shadow of their rabbi, then some of the things that he knew would come onto them. And in actual fact, the people had that same suspicion because um, later on, when Peter was really into the ministry, uh, they used to put the sick out in the street so that the shadow of Peter might just go over them because they had this superstition that there was power in the shadow of the rabbi and this also in those who were teaching about God. Which, of course, isn't true. They needed an encounter with God through those who were bringing the word to them. So this was the thing, the uh, part of the commission that we have that Jesus gave in Acts 1.8 is to do these things, to demonstrate God, to demonstrate his power, demonstrate his love and his purpose in uh, dying for, uh, so that people can be one to him. Uh, but also, I want, I want the next slide, please. <laughs> After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Why did he do that? If the disciples were the ones who were his trainees, who he was training, the truth is that there was lots and lots of people who followed Jesus, who were encouraged and thrilled by his ministry, and to show us as well that it wasn't just the 12 who the commission was for, it was for everyone who was... Uh, attracted to him and knew him so that he sent out the 72 others and sent them as it says to every town and place where he was about to go with this command heal the sick who were there tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you the 72 returned with joy and said Lord even the demons submit to us in your name so he was showing that this ministry would not be just for the twelve, but it would continue to all generations 
to his followers. For many, many years the church laid aside these things, not believing it was for today, that it was just based on the twelve. But of course we've seen in later years, in the last hundred years, perhaps there's been more of a focus on these things that the church hadn't been bothering about had come to the fore, and particularly over the last 50 years they've become more prominent in the church, which is good, but it takes a lot of boldness to actually do these things. But it's not just boldness we need, we need that experience of the outpouring of the Spirit into our lives. I know you've experienced the Spirit in your salvation, have you experienced the power of God coming on you? to support you in ministry of him and to do the things that he did to demonstrate God's love, healing the sick, casting out demons and doing those things that are not natural but rather supernatural that can only be done as we receive the power of the Holy Spirit to flow through us. And uh, that's not a difficult thing. We just have to submit to God. Usually it's... uh, uh, imparted by someone else you know ask someone to pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit and uh, that can be imparted to encourage you and to equip you for the ministry that God has left for us to do Peter gets a, a little more friendly he says I know that you acted in ignorance he's giving them a let out as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophet, saying that his Messiah would suffer. So he's saying, okay, you did that, but God used it for his purposes. And then he gives them what they should do. Repent then, turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. That's the message of today, isn't it? The gospel message, in a nutshell, repent, turn to God, give your lives over to God, and then ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit so you can be good servants of God. And uh, this comes because God encourages us to be followers of Jesus, just like the twelve. Be followers, learn of him, and go out and do what he did as demonstrations of God's love, God's power, and God's desire to have us as part of his family. And Peter finishes up. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. And then he gives them this lesson if you like of the things from their Old Testament law which they would have been familiar with and continually in the Old Testament or under the law that they were given there are lots of indicators and messages about the coming one the one who would come eventually and uh, die for them you've only got to read books like Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of the others that tell us about the Christ that God would send and uh, therefore this is the message this is the message we have it's the only message but it's the best message the message is whoever you are however much you've got however successful life is the world is not enough there's more to come the world is a little bit and our time on earth is just a little bit in view of eternity If we want an eternity in the presence of God, experience the love of God, then we need to know him. So this opportunity this morning, as we come as the church, if there are people who haven't yet grasped the fact that they need to uh, engage with God and receive him as the saviour, you can do that. And uh, this morning...
if you're a Christian, maybe you've been a Christian a long time, but haven't experienced the power of God in your life, then that can happen as well this morning. You can receive the Holy Spirit and uh, begin to move in a different way, in a more conscious way of what God is saying and God is doing, because he wants to do it through you and through me. So I invite anybody who wants any of these things, if you don't yet know God, ask for prayer this morning and someone will pray for you and share with you the path to become a child of God. If you want to receive the power of God through the Holy Spirit, then again, there'll be someone who can pray for you that you will receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit so you're empowered to do the things that God wants you to do, not just natural but supernatural too. So, thanks. That's it. Bless you. Please, if you need prayer, get prayer. Or if you're ill or got problems, ask somebody to pray for you because there are people here who are full of the Spirit and can minister God's healing, God's deliverance, God's strength to you and the answer to what problems you may have. Don't go away without seeking prayer if that's what you need this morning. Amen.